Great. Um, so we're going to transition now to um, our second speakers of the night, um, which is actually myself and Brett Wolf. And I think I know most of you all on here, um, and hopefully you know at least one of the two of us. Um, but we are extension staff with the Center for Crop Diversification. Um, we are housed in the Department of Agriculture Economics at UK. We're part of um, the Cooperative Extension Service. And tonight, um, we're going to be talking about um, just some new and trending things going on in the CSA world. Um, a lot of this stuff, you know, is maybe stuff that you've kind of seen other people doing here and there or been curious about. Um, so we kind of want to introduce a couple of these things that, you know, people are um, kind of just changing the world of CSA and, um, and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion too, if you all have, you know, ideas for your own CSAs or adaptations that you've made that you think would be helpful for other producers, that would also be really awesome to hear, um, or, or adaptations that you've seen, maybe from CSAs that you subscribe to. Um, Brett, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself at all while I get my screen shared here. Well, thanks, uh, Emily. I think one thing I was just thinking about Trisha's presentation and, and thinking about the, we often look, I think, in marketing for, and in other fields too, I guess, for this like um, logistical kind of trick or this, you know, this little tip will unlock everything. And there are those things, right? That, you know, you can use, there are programs you can use to do certain things. There are <clears throat> excuse me, approaches or strategies you can take that, that are helpful and you, that you, once you know them, uh, you've unlocked that. But I was thinking about the the notion of the, like the, she was mentioned it with the text, text marketing, but I think emails and other things too. I have people or groups in my life where when I see that I have an email or a text from them, I'm like excited to open it and see what they say. And I have people in my life where I get a text or an email from them and I sort of, you know, groan or I'm like, oh, that's not, or then the other ones where I just feel kind of neutral and I'm just like, ah, uh, maybe I'll read that later. Maybe I won't. And so the, while we can have all the tips and tricks in the world, the, the more fundamental reflection she was encouraging people to, to take about what your brand is, what your values are, whether, whether you're communicating those clearly or not is partially about finding the right customer to a business fit where you become the person that they're excited to open the email from. And that can be a blend of what you present to them, but it can also be a, a, an aspect, there can be aspects to that that is finding and connecting to the right customers in the first place. And I think that's a really powerful way of framing that. Um, and yeah, I just, I enjoyed what she, what she had to say and appreciated her, her being here. Um, but now you're stuck with us. So uh, for the next little bit here, Emily and I are going to talk. Did you want to do any sort of intro? Or you want me to just go right into it? You got it. L launch. Okay. Uh, so we had talked with Bethany a little bit uh, a little bit ago about some different ideas of what we might be able to talk about or what other others might be able to talk about doing some brainstorming and uh, we. <clears throat> excuse me, we, we settled on, we were going to talk about this new and trending stuff. And, and much like the, what I was just talking about with the email marketing and the, and the text marketing, I think that the notion of new and trending is kind of a misnomer, you know, that uh, the Beatles, I guess, said nothing you can sing that can't be sung, nothing you can do that it hasn't, you know, hasn't been done. And I think there's, you know, there's nothing new under the under the sun in many ways. And so new and trending is is a little bit of a misnomer, but there has been some really important ways that CSA has changed across time. And I thought everybody kind of knew about these things, and maybe everybody on this call, in fact, already does. But I think it was it was maybe worth a little bit of an exploration back to how CSAs were at one point and how they've changed across time. And so I think uh, I just start with the background. It's not going to be the background that is, uh, you know, this is what CSA and I explained it to you, but just a little bit of a reflection on maybe like the historical uh, origins of CSA. And so I, I have been a CSA member since I think 
2010, maybe somewhere in there, somewhere in my, my younger years when I knew what year it was, uh, I had become a CSA member and it was from a local farm and uh, I was excited to engage in the, in that. And at that time, even, so that's what, almost 15 years ago, it was a very different landscape. I'm going to say, I won't go too far down the reminiscent uh, rabbit hole here, but even before that, CSA has meant something very different across time. It has origins in the United States. A lot of folks kind of tie it to the Northeast and Midwest U.S. Uh, I think particularly in some cases where there were immigrant communities from the uh, Scandinavian countries and other places. There's also this tradition of this Take system, which is seen as one of the forebears of the modern CSA system. And both of these are these highly cooperative models that are the historic basis for what we see now as community supported agriculture. But those systems had a very different kind of ethic uh, and just overall energy to them than I think what we see now. And not to say good or bad or worse, or some of us will think it's a good change, some of us will think maybe it's not. But they did have, I think, uh, a certain DIY and cooperative spirit um, where I, I almost think of it as like the DIY kind of punk rock vibe where it's this really dense network of, of these oddball people, one of whom is the farmer. The other people are kind of cooperating in that. And they're uh, not only are they buying a share up front or something like that, they're actually helping to arrange for fertilizer and seed to get to where it needs to go and staffing the pickups. And there was just a, a different kind of origin story to CSA from what we see now. And um, even back when I uh, started, there were still CSAs that had a requirement that you would come out and do some work on the farm for some period of time. Now, the waning of that might be a variety of different factors in the customer preference side, but also maybe the farmers saw that their untrained laborers coming out and, and doing this work was actually, it was more harmful to have somebody come out for five hours of untrained work than it was to, to have them do nothing at all. But I think there was, you know, this idea of community supported agriculture, as far as its meaning goes has shifted across time. I think that CSA was born out of a commitment to sustainability. I think there were people who were within the organic movement and even some of the beyond organic, you know, critical of, of some aspects of what they would consider conventional farming. Um, and I think that there was a really deep and strong connection to the local food systems, maybe in some different ways than we see now, though obviously the local food system component runs through uh, all of this. And so th this is just to say CSA at one point meant something a little bit different. And I think uh, our conception of it over the last 10 or 15 years has shifted. And it has, <clears throat> we've developed, I would say, uh, an idea of what the traditional CSA was. And we're going to see from, from Emily here in just a few minutes how that concept of the traditional CSA has shifted and expanded and developed in some of these new and up, you know, up, uh, trends that, it, that are developing and, and things that we're seeing more and more of. So when I think of a traditional CSA, so something in the lines of that 2010 to 2020, maybe model, 2019, 2018 model, um, it was pretty much exclusively your customer pays your money up front. So that means at the beginning of the season, you owe a check to the grower. There were some who were doing, you know, you could do half up front and half at the midpoint of the season. Uh, but that is a really interesting, challenging uh, barrier for some consumers who are not used to dropping, you know, and in the current market, you know, five to eight hundred dollars at the beginning of a season for a full season share. In some cases, uh, they're used to spending that money gradually over time. Uh, so that was this is one of the things about the traditional CSA that used to be kind of a barrier that. Uh, to spoil the punchline, these are things that I think some of these trends that have emerged over time that Emily will be talking about have helped to overcome or bridge or, or, or address. <clears throat> now, on that customer up front, customer money up front thing, that was really nice for the farmer because you had all the money at the time of year when your, a lot of your expenses happened, when you had maybe needed to repair that equipment over the winter, when you needed to buy your seed or buy your fertilizer or whatever it may be. Uh, but it, so that was kind of one of the selling points as far as from the, the farmer side was this thing can really work for you. 
Uh, another part of it was that you get what we grow. You get what grows uh, as a consumer. And it, obviously that's still uh, philosophically true. I don't, we aren't creating food out of nowhere, but um, <clears throat> the, the most uh, progressive vision of customizability at that time was to have a box at the end of the line when you picked up your share where you could swap one thing for another in that moment. Um, and so that another was another challenge to traditional CSAs that I think uh, we're seeing some considerable movement on and have seen some considerable movement on. Um, I think there's still a lot of CSAs that do offer a diversity of crops and products, but in many cases, the with the single farm CSA vision, it was you had to kind of do it all. And some people still try to do it all and still succeed in doing it all. They're, they're more, uh, more talented individuals than I. But I think we've seen some changes to where there's a specialization among some types of growers and then a collaborate collaborative and uh, on the grower side to be able to offer a diversity of crops to the consumer without having to necessarily produce that yourself. <clears throat> I think several of the things uh, that I've discussed before fit into this next item, which was that there was a very distinct died in the wool locavore CSA consumer. And that market segment is not overly large. And if you are live in places where uh, the local food movement wasn't quite as strong in um, uh, as far as how, how widespread it was, that was even more difficult. It was even more difficult for you to find those consumers. And because you had to, it was not overly convenient to find out about the farm CSA. You had to kind of find out from a friend of a friend. Maybe you would get an email here or there. Uh, there certainly wasn't any of the campaigns like I'm going to be talking about later to help build uh, visibility around that. And so ultimately what, what people ended up seeing was that they, there was a, a limitations on how much of the market they could reach. And it, so it could be because of how hardcore they were. It could be because of the cap customer up front, customer money up front thing that I talked about earlier. It could be that people don't like not having any options, but there was in that traditional model of CSA, some challenges associated with growing your CSA, retaining customers and finding new customers the next year. And then the other one uh, back, this is a, a little bit of the, you know, from back in the, back in my day, but, I, it was not as common to see things like you had to kind of commit to 20 to 26, 28 weeks of produce from a particular farm. Uh, sometimes they would do a half season share and there was some degree of, of ad adaptability. But again, all of these are things that I think there are some people who think still think of CSA in this way. And I've actually encountered some over the last uh, few months as I've been talking about this more who still are in a mindset that this is this is how things are with the CSA. On the flip side, there's some people who have come to the world of CSA in the last five or 10 years who this sounds almost like, I don't know, the draconian old uh, uh, bygone era. And I guess in some ways it is. So um, I think to contrast this with what's coming next that I'm, as I hand it over to Emily, is some of the adaptations and things that again, they're not necessarily new and trending in the sense that they're the hip new thing that's coming out, but they have been these major shifts we have seen in how CSAs are delivered and marketed and managed to, I think, try to open it up, up to more consumers. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I, Brett is always so good at giving us the background um, of things that we're, <laughs> we're about to talk about. And it is really, really helpful, I think, particularly in CSAs. Um, you know, we got into this discussion on the Hort Culture podcast last month, which if you don't um, subscribe, I'll go ahead and drop a um, note here that it's a great podcast that Brett, Brett is a part of. But we kind of got into this discussion about like, well, CSAs are so all over the place now. What even defines a CSA at all? you know, like they're so varied where it used to be this kind of narrow idea of what it was. And now it's kind of all over the place. Um, and I think, you know, we didn't really settle on a specific set of rules, but, you know, something obviously is that you have this, um, at least for a specific amount of time, a commitment from a customer, right? Instead of just showing up weekly at the farmer's market and kind of getting what you get that day. Um, but outside of that, uh, we're going to kind of go, kind of going to go through 
um, some of these adaptations that um, we've seen over the past couple of years and then really focusing on this consumer centric aspect of them. So, you know, in contrast to what Brett was saying about how CSAs used to really be this like really intense locavore, like I don't care what food I'm getting in my box, I'll eat it because it's local and grown by this farmer that I know. Um, you know, it's a really narrow customer base. It's a really small percentage of your population that's going to be okay with that. So what a lot of these trends do is just widen your net, right? That you're able to cast, which just lets you, you know, have access to a lot more customers. It kind of gives your customers a more traditional shopping experience um, as opposed to the traditional CSA models. So first, um, I'm going to talk about these four different um, types of customizable farm shares. So, so these range from super, you know, customizable being like the most extreme to just kind of like slightly customizable. Maybe if you just want to do a little bit of add on, um, not so intense. Um, in addition to these different um, customizable farm share options, you also have this aspect of delivery that I'm not going to really go into so much, um, but it's just kind of an added adaptation that can be added onto any of these, right? And even like a traditional CSA model, but just kind of making it um, more accessible to your customers. Um, I have this little box down in the left-hand corner um, and it just says why. So like, why would we even consider having customizable farm shares if it's going to be more work on us, right? I'm just, traditionally, I would just pick you know, whatever I had available that week, have it, have it ready for my customers and that you get what you get. Um, but we've seen some from, from some data that we've collected that customer retention is way higher when you have at least some sort of flexibility. It gives your customers some kind of agency in what it is they're getting that week. You know, even though they committed to you for the whole season or maybe for a couple weeks, it still is nice to not have to get, um, ghost pepper, if you don't love ghost pepper, you know, and things like that. Um, a lot of these options also help you increase your sales. So in addition to the, you know, the box that they've already paid for, or maybe um, the thing that they've already committed to having these other options they can add on or things like that um, will incrementally increase your sales, which over time will increase your sales dramatically. And then just like what I mentioned earlier, uh, all of these just really give you an access to a broader and more diverse audience, which is um, the goal for these options, at least. So I'm going to go into these a little bit more detail. So these two options I'm deeming as semi-flexible. And I mean that in terms of, um, you know, for the grower, um, they're giving these semi-flexible options to their customer. So this first one I would say is the least flexible, um, most traditional, which is this farmer's choice plus add-on. So you just have this like traditional CSA model where, you know, okay, I have these eight items in my, in my share this week. But in addition to that, you're going to have some extra items. And, you know, you could do, I've seen it done where an extra is built in. So like you have these eight items that are, everybody gets no matter what. And then maybe you have one or two items that are, people can kind of pick and choose what they want, but the box will remain the same price. It's just like, they give them that little bit of agency that kind of makes it unique and creative. Um, I know some CSAs will maybe do like a, this week, you know, an option is you could do a you pick of the blackberries that just came on or the flowers that just started blooming, you know, so something like that, just kind of like a little bit of a value add. Um, it's also, I put on here, it's a great way to sell extras. So if you don't want to do, you know, the add-ons as a built-in part of your box, but really actually, um, you know, charge extra for those add-ons, like, let's say you have excess eggs that week. I put on some like, like a sun choke, just like a really unique item on here that like, you know, maybe people have never had before, but you're also not going to sell 50 of, um, but you know, you have a couple that maybe people can choose from things like that. Um, just a good way to get a couple extra dollars per transaction, um, which obviously will add up over time. So then going on to the next one, which is like the next level of flexibility would be these flexible farm shares, um, which isn't, this one is actually, I think, uh, um, probably one of the most common ones that I've seen lately. Um, but basically you have, you know, your, your set box, you have your set price, and then you have a list available for substitutions. 
So let's say, you know, you have these eight items and then there's these four items available for substitution. So if you don't like um, asparagus, first of all, you're crazy. But second of all, um, you can swap it out for some extra kale, you know, or something like that if you want. Um, and sometimes this is, you know, if you're using, if you have physical CSA pickup, this can be like in the form of a swap box or a swap table where, you know, you have all of your products laid out and then that's what's available for swapping that day. So, you know, um, at the end of the pickup, your customer can go to that swap table and say, you know what, I'm not really like feeling these tomatoes this week. I've had tomatoes like every night this week. I'm going to switch these out for something else. Um, but you can also do it digitally and virtually where you just kind of have um, options they can select into their cart if you have a, a digital platform you use. Um, this other note on here is it's just a great way to accommodate allergies, preferences, and pickiness. Um, I think that's obvious, but it also is just this really nice, uh, it just, to me, it just makes it feel less restricted, you know, or less restrictive, I guess, um, to at least be able to switch out a couple that I really hate, um, you know, just something to think about. And then we'll have these fully flexible options. Um, so these are where your customer has essentially complete agency over what it is that they're getting within reason, of course, within when you have available. Um, but this first one is the buy down model. So essentially what that is, is you still have that upfront payment. So, you know, it's still going to be however much you charge for your season. Let's say it's like $700. They still are going to pay that. Um, but what that really is just doing is putting credit into their, their customer account. So some farms do it with, you know, they'll still release a CSA share each week. And you can use that credit towards that, or some of them just use it, you know, maybe at the farmer's market, um, your customers can just come and pay um, with their credit. So you still get that money up front. You still get the benefits of, you know, having that money in the, in the shoulder season, in the off season, excuse me. Um, but you, uh, they have complete flexibility over how they want to spend it. Um, the, this point about needing to decide on rollover bucks is a really, really good point. And I, to be honest, I'm not sure how farms have addressed it. So if anyone has any um, notes on that, I would love to hear. But just kind of, you know, at the end of the season, I just had a way busier summer than I expected. And I only spent 500 of the $700 that I had committed to this farm. What happens to that extra $200? You know, it's that question. And, um, you know, for me, that's definitely something you would want to put into your CSA agreement, member agreement at the beginning of the season. You know, you say, listen, that's just part of it. It, it goes you know, it goes to the farm, you're still supporting our operation, but it doesn't roll over to the next year for the sake of, you know, ease of accounting and record keeping and things like that. Um, but maybe you offer some like special holiday items or something like that that can be used at the end of the year. Um, you can also use it, you know, for other items. So like, let's say you have like some swag, uh, you have some t-shirts and hats. It's a great promotional items. People can use those credits to purchase, or maybe you do plant starts at different parts of the season, that kind of stuff. So it really is just like, creating this credit account with a specific farmer um, instead of having these designated boxes. And then the other option we have here is the fully customizable one. So um, definitely, so basically this is just, you still have a share. They still have, you know, however many items um, they can select that week, but um, it's fully customizable. They can choose whatever they want to put in it based on the options you have available. So, you know, you, we definitely suggest having this like base share or suggested share um, just because one, um, I think it, people a lot of time will lean on the grower anyway for their suggestions for things. Um, but two, um, hopefully to make it somewhat easier on yourself in terms of, you know, I don't, I don't have any like hardcore data on this, but you know, if you have 60% of your, um, customers just going with the one that you suggested, um, it would just make it a lot easier on yourself instead of having to pack all of these different boxes each week. Um, and this one, and really all of these would be made so much easier with software support. Um, but this one for sure, right? You definitely need to have some kind of online digital software platform supporting you. Um, unless you just want to go essentially back to a farmer's market model. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of bridging that it's, or it's kind of teetering on that line of like, you know, is this a CSA anymore kind of thing. Um, 
but again, it's just kind of going back to that agreement that people uh, uh, committed to at the beginning of the season. Um, let's see. I see we have something coming through the chat. Would this be like a market card? Yeah, we're talking about the buy down buy buy down model. Yes. Uh, yeah, very similar slash, you know, the same. Um, if you've ever heard of a market card kind of system, it would be the same for that. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say uh, uh, the maybe in that in that buy down model it could be that the prices that are available to you to purchase are like below what, sorry, that are available to the customer to purchase are below what they would be to purchase at farmer's markets. Cause that's sort of one of the, the draws of CSA is that theoretically in many cases, the per unit cost of the CSA is slightly lower than it would be to buy it just spontaneously, you know, at, at retail. Um, and so that might be, you know, part of the selling is that, my tomatoes in the buy down are three dollars a pound, but if I sell them at market, they're four dollars a pound. And so it, you know, it could be that kind of vibe. And, and just in case there's anybody out there like me who's like not sure, like they, they, you immediately go to the logistics of it with that support, software support thing. The general process is in a given week, you go out to your field, you look and see how many of a given crop you have, you put that into the system, and then your customer has to make an interaction with the system on their side to select what they want. It then generates a pick list for you as well as the customizable box shares. So that software support thing, I agree with you, is really, really a game changer. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. I just had a question come through on direct message that I wanna uh, ask to you, Brett, if you have any insight into, you know, looking at these four um, models, if we're thinking about someone who's just starting out with a CSA and they want to offer these flexible, at least, you know, some sort of flexibility, which of these models would be the easiest? My initial instinct is kind of this farmer's choice and add-ons. Um, and then, you know, and then maybe the buy down, you know, that one is definitely needs more software support, I would think. So that is kind of a learning curve on that aspect. Um, but this traditional CSA model plus just offering the extras is my initial uh, thought. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I 100% agree because you don't, you, you, with the other approaches where you have flexibility, you have to essentially figure out how much inventory you're going to have, which is a whole other step of like how to assess how many cabbages I'm going to have ready on Thursday for my drop. Versus on Thursday, I go out, I see I have enough cabbages, I harvest those, I come in, I assemble the boxes, and then I kind of communicate out what those things are going to be. I would say, yeah, the the flex, I mean, this is one of those tensions, I think, is we talk about customer centric, and that's great, but you really are becoming less farmer centric and making yeah. it more difficult and more logistically complicated. And so the farmer's choice of these is like the most, like you said, traditional CSA vibe. And so that would tend to be the one that I would go for. And, you know, if you're new and if you're in an area that is new, that that you're the first CSA or, you know, one of a handful of CSAs, you might be able to find those dyed in the wool customers initially to, to establish that relationship and then build your complexity of your market across time. But multiple of the farms that I know that use the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple of the farms that I know that use the more complex systems started out with not not being flexible and then they just felt that in order to grow their customer base they had to go towards something more customizable so i don't think it's at all a bad idea to start out with something a little less flexible especially if you're able to recruit some customers and start small on number of number of uh, shares because it the you know 30 sounds like nothing 30 csa share 30 csa 30 share csa is actually quite the undertaking um so just a thought yeah yeah thank you um uh, well, i mentioned several times thinking about these like digital software digital platforms um you know i think particularly when you're thinking about straying away from your traditional csa model in a lot of ways they feel really necessary to me at least someone who's not me as someone who's not like you know, extremely logistically minded. I would like to do like the least amount of that kind of work as I could. I would like to just focus on the growing and the talking to people aspects of, of the operation. Um, 
this is where these digital platforms and software really take a lot of that heavy lift. Um, so these are just some of the ways that these digital platforms can help you. Um, you have the online ordering aspect, the membership management, financial reporting, um, you know, scheduling out deliveries, if that's something that you are interested in. And then these, you know, uh, makes it easy for your customers to uh, customize their subscriptions. Um, sorry, my little box is moving all over the place. Um, but, you know, I just kind of wanted to highlight the benefits of taking the time to learn one of these softwares because I know there is there you know there obviously would be a learning curve and also in addition to that a financial investment right into these digital platforms um, you know you could you could bake some of that um, financial aspect into the CSA um, share price um, but in addition to that you have to think about you know what are the pain points of the CSA for you or what are things that you anticipate being really painful for you to go through and you have this like opportunity cost of, you know, I will enjoy this a hundred times more or at least 50% more if I do not have to deal with trying to figure out all of these delivery scheduling stuff. When someone is on vacation this week, someone else is on vacation this other week, you know, but they can just go in and handle it themselves. Um, you know, I think is a, a really huge, um, yeah, a huge thing to consider. And I don't have the any specific platforms listed on here just because I don't I didn't you know I didn't want to shout any out over others but happy to if you guys if you are interested in one of these and want to send us an email afterwards we can send you some suggested um, ones just based on popularity with other Kentucky growers not based on you know our personal experience we're not CSA growers Brett and myself but um, you know just based on what we've seen around the state um, and then you know. Kind of going back to um, some of what Trisha was talking about, the really, really nice part of these digital platforms is that most of them have a marketing integration aspect. So if you're you know, trying to do a newsletter each week with your CSA share, um, some email marketing, you know, text message marketing, if that's something you're interested in, um, a lot of these platforms will like have that baked into it so that you know, it will auto-populate the items you have available that week, um, let you add a little blurb. It'll, you know, auto populate your items, just item descriptions, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, just make it really easy on you um, in terms of, you know, interacting with your customers on a weekly basis. So that's something else to think about, you know, if that's, if the marketing aspect is really challenging for you, this might be able to um, help you with that. And then I know Trisha mentioned my digital farmer earlier, and I'm sure everyone on this call knows about this podcast, but this, ep this episode that I have listed here, 140 tips for choosing the right CSA software for your farm. 142 is a lot of tips, um, but it doesn't feel overwhelming to listen to, I will say. It's a very um, approachable, you know, and a lot of them are kind of self-explanatory, you know, but um, really, really helpful when you're trying to think through what actual, what software would actually be useful for you in your farm operation. Um, I have a QR code there that links to that episode and we can also share this presentation after um so don't feel like you have to snap that really quickly um let's see i have a question up here before i move on um or a point amber said i think this is where i would lean into educating the consumer on what is available and how to use it yeah before you invest in a platform yeah that's a really really good point um so just kind of thinking about you know um your capability in terms of addressing these kinds of things with your customer before having to lean on a digital platform to do it. I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me and just kind of spending some time with that and seeing if it works for you and if you're good at it, right? And if you like doing it. Um, so the next innovation I'm gonna talk about uh, briefly is using CSAs as food access points. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about these trends as, ways to access a broader audience. Um, food access is a huge audience, you know, that I think, you know, a lot of times we don't consider, particularly for CSAs and other aspects of local food. Maybe we have the farmer's markets, you know, in Kentucky, we have the double dollars program. Um, but CSAs are, have historically been seen as this kind of uh, high-end, uh, I don't know, 
trying to be politically correct here. Um, mom would say, my mom would say, people who have more dollars than cents. <laughs> yeah. Bougie, I'll right. say it. Bougie, Bougie. high yes. end, typical, yes, absolutely. You know, high income, highly educated, elite. I'll just yeah. rip the band off. Absolutely. I mean, and realistically, you know, someone who can afford to spend eight hundred dollars at one time, um, you know, that's obviously it breaks out over time to be a really affordable option in terms of how to get your local food. But to be able to have the the resources to spend that at one time is, again, a very small percentage of the population. So um, just kind of thinking about these food access points as really broadening the audience that you have access to and that you're able to sell your, your food um, and products to. So this is just a little uh, going off of that, you know, thinking about um, the amount of people in Kentucky that use EBT um, as, a, as a way to purchase their food. It has one in eight people, right? So that is if you just think about, you know, if you're at the farmer's market, one in every eight people that you see could potentially be a customer. But if you if you don't accept EBT for your CSA share, then they're no longer a potential customer for you, you know. So I'm going to kind of just like conceptually think about some modifications that we can make um, in order to access this group of people that maybe you're not thinking about accessing at this point. Um Let's see. And then if any, if I don't address your question now, we will address it at the end. Um, just want to go ahead and say that, but all right. So thinking about accepting EBT for CSA. So it's a, it's a, it's a different thing, right. Than accepting it for your farmer's market, because again, that's just like your singular transaction every week. It's just like someone would purchase something at the grocery store with their EBT card, similar setup but with the CSA, right. You have traditionally this upfront commitment of, um, a huge amount of funds, obviously not doable for someone who's getting their um, funding every month. So um, I have these just things to consider um, if this is something that you're interested in doing. Um, you know, like I mentioned, they a lot EBT customers do not have the ability to pay far in advance. It, I think it varies state to state. And I didn't put the Kentucky specific ones on here, um, but I know we have Sharon Spencer on here. So I don't know if she has any uh, um, insight into this, but how many days in advance you can have it, but, you know, but I know if you get your funding once a month, it would make sense to me that it would be definitely no more than that, but probably even a little bit more restrictive than that. Um, so um, yeah, just something to think about. So you have, you know, again, this upfront commitment question of if someone's not able to pay me upfront, how is it a CSA? Or how can I guarantee that they're actually going to be giving me their business every week, right? So um, you can still do this written commitment. You can still sign a CSA membership agreement with your customers at the beginning of the season and say, um, you know, even though you're not going to be paying me all up front, you're still committing to doing this every month or every week or whatever it may be. Um, you can provide other incentives that keep those customers there. So delivery options, flexible pickup options, um, which, you know, for people who use EBT, I think is particularly important. Um, you, I think it's like 73% of people who use EBT have children. Um, I mean, like one in four have someone who is disabled or elderly. So just kind of thinking about, um, you know, the possibly unique um, or at least concentrated needs of this population that you want to consider. Um, the other option is requiring a non-EBT deposit. So upfront, if you want to do with, alongside your CSA membership agreement, you know, you can require anything. It doesn't have to be a huge deposit, but just something that kind of guarantees that commitment from them for the rest of the season. Um, and then this accepting payments aspect is obviously extremely critical. So there are ways to get around um, accepting the payment individually if you sell your products at a farmer's market that accepts um, EBT payments. Um, I'm sure if you if you do sell your farmer at a farmer's market that does, you've already engaged with this before. Um, but a lot of the markets, I know the Lexington markets do a really good job of this, um, where like the individual farmer doesn't have to have the setup for it, but you can actually pay the market and then the market works with the vendor um, to get them paid. So it can do the same thing with a CSA um, yeah, Sharon's dropping some knowledge into the 
into the chat. Thank you, Sharon, so much. Um, yeah, so it's just something to consider, right? It's like an added logistical thing that is difficult um, to think through at least initially, but it's definitely not a, a prohibitive barrier by any means. Um, so if it's something you're interested in, we have people that will work with you um, in getting this getting this going. Um, so this is a sliding scale CSA. So this one, I think, um, you know, is a more, or not more approachable, but just a, an option that I think, you know, hopefully would make a lot of sense to um, a lot of people. But this is an example from Wonka's Harvest, which is a farm out of Madison, Wisconsin. And they actually did a webinar on this, which I linked down at the bottom right-hand corner um, through the CSA Innovation Network. Really, really awesome webinar. There's three or four different farms featured on it that all do sliding scale CSAs and they all do it entirely differently. Um, you know, obviously some thematic overlaps and stuff, but there's more than one way to do this is essentially what I'm saying. But I'll just go ahead, go ahead and read, um, you know, what they said up here, but it says, we offer suggested prices which reflect the dollar value of produce provided in each box. By paying more than the suggested price, you are helping a neighbor receive the same quantity and quality of pro produce as you. If you cannot pay the suggested price, use the drop down menu to select what you're able to pay. No matter what you end up paying, you will be receiving the exact same quantity and quality produce as the next member. So essentially, people are electively saying, I choose to pay more because I know that I have the resources to do so. And I know that that means that someone else another CSA member will get the same amount of produce that I get. Um, at the same time, you have people who cannot afford to pay, you know, the standard share um, price. And so they'll pay maybe half or, you know, whatever it is that you want to designate. And um, I wish I had this data um, and I, I, I'll probably go search, seek it out after this, but um, generally the, data on sliding scale uh, models in local food come out really, really well. That a lot of people who, um, you know, can pay more, will pay more, at least a little bit. And um, it all evens out in the end for the most part. And I think I saw Sharon Stone was on here earlier. It's not on here anymore. Um, but we have the Wood Hill Community Market in Lexington um, I don't know if they're still doing the sliding scale or not, um, but it is something that they used to do in a really cool model of essentially people just electively saying, yeah, I can pay $50 for this share versus, you know, I can pay $25 for the same share. Um, and yeah, so I have this chart on here that kind of breaks down Wonka's harvest um, and what their, you know, different payment options come out to be. So they have a, a full share weekly and a full share biweekly. I'm just going to go off of those two. The other two are like, you know, bountiful. It's just like a bigger share, like an extra large or something like that. Um, but you have, so they actually offer shares at 50% of the cost all the way up to 150%, but they just put 125 on here because essentially no one pays the 150. It just feels like too much. I think like conceptually just think about paying um, that much more, but um, you can see like, you know, the, they also do the weekly and upfront options, which is another uh, accessibility question you, that you can answer. Um, you know, if someone can't pay upfront 50% um, of the share, but they can pay that weekly price, like I can afford to do $14 a week versus $252 upfront, you know, just kind of breaking it out for people also makes it more accessible. Um, again, I can share this presentation out if you want to take a deeper look at this chart, because I think it's super helpful just like, Again, for me, just to think through what does this even look like in terms of offering the sliding scale option for people. All right, let's see before we go on. All right, Sharon put her um, contact information in the chat if anyone wants to reach out to her about accepting SNAP and you know, yeah, EBT, super awesome. Yeah, Mustard Seed Farm. Yes, thank you, Bethany. Yeah, um, she's saying that Mustard Seed Farm, so they do a sliding scale CSA and they actually made more uh, or broke even over nine years using sliding scale compared to the traditional payment structure. Yeah, and I think that's generally what we see, um, you know, and, and it a lot of things, a lot of it probably comes down to knowing your customer base and knowing what they're willing to pay for. But um, 
yeah, just something to consider. Well, Emily will continue kind of looking through and see if we had missed any questions. Uh, we decided to end with fireworks, you know, end with a bang, institutional engagement. <laughs> um, but I think this is as boring as the term sounds. This is one of the more uh, exciting, relatively recent and novel developments in CS, the CSA landscape that, uh, that I've seen come along since I've been uh, involved with it. Um, and I, I think before you jump in and say, oh, uh, look at all this stuff about institutional engagement, then why should we even care about this concept of institutional engagement? And I think one of the easy answers is that institutions uh, purchase lots of food, they have lots of people involved in them, so it's sort of just an opportunity to reach a new market. And I think that is true, and I'm not going to say that, but I think there are some people who, who pitch a message that that we get to vote if you're if you're not a foodie person you say we get to vote whenever there's an election and if you are a foodie person or a local economics person you say vote with your dollar vote with your fork and i think that those messages can be useful and can be helpful but they put this real uh limited scope on the ways that we can interact with these larger organizations that represent us that serve us and I think there are other opportunities to engage with those institutions. And a lot of the CSA folks have figured out ways to do that. Um, and, and so I think that institutions have a lot of power. They have a lot of resources and money. They have access to uh, larger networks to be able to communicate out as far as supporting and sharing information. And so I think for all of those reasons, the ability to channel and plug into these different institutions is a way that we can express power as a, as a group that's interested in local foods or that's interested in, in you know, supporting CSAs or whatever. Um, so I have just a couple of different types of institutional engagement that I wanted to briefly talk about uh, and, and before we move on to just some, some questions. And so I have them summarized here, but I have a little bit more, a few more points to, to share about each of them as we move through. So the <clears throat> the first one that I'll talk about is the uh, notion of this technical assistance, and I would call technical leadership. And so they've gotten shout outs multiple times already, but the CSA Innovation Network has done a lot to, in a very specific, targeted way, support the community-supported agriculture world. Um, and they have a, these resource pages and other things that you can go and find information. Multiple of the pieces that Emily referenced are available on their site. They have a series of YouTube videos with presentations and, and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, I thought one of the coolest things that they did this year uh, as part of their you know, supporting of, of vis uh, visibility and marketing was that if you signed up to with gave me your email address and information, they sent you this marketing packet with assets for CSA week that you could use on your social media. So take a little bit of the legwork out, connect you again to this larger movement. That's not just a, I voted for such and such person and that's my civic duty or I, that's my you know, extent of my interaction with institutions. Um, they're actually as, as an organization allowing you to buy in and participate uh, with what they're doing along with providing a ton of really, really helpful information. Trisha talked about that. I imagine you're going to hear uh, more about that as you go along. But it, as you look at the uh, the bullet points that are here, there might be things on here that jump out to you that uh, you would want to, to look further into. And I would really recommend that. But our, like, our group has been heavily involved with the CSA Innovation Network uh, and you know learning from them, supporting where we can. And so... That's one way I think institutionally uh, that we can engage, that CSAs have engaged and to see that level back, you know, again, not to go too far down the rabbit hole of back in my day, but a long, a while back, CSAs were going, essentially going door to door. It was one farm recruiting one customer at a time. It was, there was a sense of what the movement was. There was a sense of what the marketing scheme was, but a lot of times you had to kind of educate people on that one-to-one -one basis, it kind of fell to the farmer. And it still does in many cases, but this broader acceptance and embrace from these larger institutional partners, I think is a huge development and one that I would hope to see farmers 
producers uh, and local food activists lean into more uh, because there's a lot of power in these institutions. Um, another way that institutions have leaned in to CSA and supported CSA is with these voucher programs. Uh, so this is a general, generally speaking, a self-insured employer that is someone who has a an insurance plan that they offer to their that they they pay for that they offer to their customers can save quite a bit of money. It turns out uh, through the I'll talk about that in the next bullet point here in a second, but uh, it can be attractive to those types of employers, um, as well as others who are just interested in providing an additional benefit for employee satisfaction and health. Uh, the general premise here is that they offer a coupon for money off of a CSA share. So I am a UK employee. Because I'm a UK employee and because my benefits office and my university offers a voucher for a CSA, I can sign up and I receive a $200 credit that is it's taxed as the income on my pay stub, but I receive a $200 credit that I can use toward the purchase of a CSA. So it takes it from a you know $650 charge to a $450 charge for the season. Um, there are health benefits and there are social benefits. There's all kinds of good things about this. I have here on the right a screenshot that I took from our friends over at the Far Kentucky Farm Share Coalition. Uh, them, they have a nice packet that is aimed primarily at employers who are considering voucher programs that they can go through and see these 10 reasons why they might want to choose it. They have a packet that or how to set it up, et cetera. But um, they have seen, we have seen the expansion of some of these voucher programs. And, and I'm very proud to say that Kentucky, the state of Kentucky, the University of Kentucky has been a real leader in these types of efforts. And uh, we're not the only ones who do it, but we have played a really big role in that for so much, you know, about food and all those other things that we hear about Kentucky, uh, we don't necessarily perform the best sometimes in the in the big statistics that uh, get, make it to the news. But this is one where we are really playing this innovative role that I think is really cool. Um, so that's, that's another way that institutional power is being leveraged. So this is just a, I just threw this in. This is a picture of a few of my favorite nerds. Um, so some of our colleagues, Tim, Tim Woods in the foreground, Jody uh, uh, benefits folks uh, back, back there on the right is Jairus Rossi. Um, Tim and Jairus have done a lot of the research components. Uh, Jody, Vanessa, uh, and the other benefits folks have done some of the, a lot of the legwork in support of, of getting that voucher program into place. So that's just a shout out to them. This is a picture where they, they had won this award from the, some group, some professional group of college benefits programs. Um, so it was kind of a cool thing. So along with that, um, voucher program, there's also come some of this research work that's been done. And I think this is an example where institutionally, you see that I have, the, I'll skip to my last bullet point here to hammer it home. In universities, for instance, research labs, whatever, can provide a, a certain level of legitimacy and knowledge power to, to some of these local food movements, including things like CSA. So through some of the work, they were able to demonstrate that the voucher program and the consumption of CSA, uh, vegetable, uh, especially crop-based CSA, had significant health benefits. In turn, that then has an economic impact. It was something, uh, the actual exact statistic is, but it's, I'll get pretty close. For every dollar invested in the CSA program, the University of Kentucky saw a $2.37 reduction in healthcare costs for that person. And so it's particularly uh, happened, it's particularly acute in the case of uh, people who are who are at risk and who, for one or not one or a number of different health conditions, who then engage in the CSA are able to reduce the number of times they go to the doctor, which then in turn reduces the number of times that uh, the amount of money that's spent, et cetera. And so that that's one of those justifications again where we can interface with these institutions and CSA have reached this level of credibility and institutional support through the dedication of people who believe in it pushing these institutions to do more work in this area, frankly. And so that that's uh, overall the overarching thing I'm, I'm trying to get at with a lot of this hyping these institutions and the way that they've come alongside CSA, because I think it is really, really important. So on the right, I just have this graphic, which came out of one of the uh, Farm Share Coalition's packets that they send to employers. 
And I, I just have it here because here's this nice infographic, looks really nice, this great information, but the most important part for me as a part of this institution is this series of references down below. I'm sorry, could you go back? Uh, the series of references down below. So we have CDC, but then below that we have those two of those folks that were in that picture, Jairus and Tim, along with some other people. Um, they have this published research that we're able to then in turn use to demonstrate the, the health effects, to demonstrate these positive uh, outcomes, which then in turn can help to build credibility, to make it possible for voucher programs to get expanded, et cetera. And so um, I think as, a, as a, an employee of a public university, I, it's part of our mission to do good research and do good work to support these types of things. It could be ha and we have a lot of institutional power that can come along with that. And so I, again, I, I think it's a credit to the people, the, the activists and the farmers and the academics and everybody else who has pushed for this type of engagement to happen. It's really, really amazing to see. And it is one of the more uh, recent institutional, or sorry, well, recent uh, trends, you know, hot trends in uh, CSA. Couple of others here, shout out to, uh, I think Sharon, uh, Sharon was on, she, she might've fallen asleep once I came back on, but um, uh, KDA, and Hort Council and the Food Connection and previously the uh, the Bluegrass Farm to Table and Oak have done this tremendous job to come together, um, particularly I think through the pandemic starting out there to really have this big campaign, local Kentucky campaign for CSA. And this is a huge thing for me to see, and you'll see, you'll see why here in just a, in just a minute or two, but um, so this is one event that, 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 that was put together here in Kentucky and alongside or just after the national level CSA week. I mentioned CSA Network had done this stuff to uh, see that down there on the right bottom hand, right hand. It's a CSA week promotional package. Well, that was where you could sign up and they would send you different things that you could drop into your social media to help build awareness of the movement and build awareness of the marketing approach. This stuff is cool. And it has not been around for forever. And it has taken the work, dedicated work of, of people pushing it. And again, farmers and activists and uh, customers, all of these people working together to really build the visibility for what is ultimately a very unique and special uh, form of marketing. And the reason, part of the reason why I feel so, no, you're good. Uh, part of the reason why I feel so, amazed by this is so this is a picture that's me on the right uh don't know what I was doing there exactly but my photography skills have improved since then but we did this event back at West 6th back in I think we did the first one maybe in 2016 or no I guess it would have been 2017 uh where we just hosted this little CSA fair educational event thing and it was the first time that we had really done something like this. I worked with a number of different people, Ashton from uh, then from Bluegrass Farm to Table, now with the Food Connection and the local agent at that time, Delia, who now works in the Hort Department. Um, and we, we put on this little event and, and we had like 100 people turn out, 150 people turn out. We had, I think, 16 farms there. And we were so excited about that turnout. And to see the amount of institutional interest and support that has sprung up again from our friends at KDA, from our friends at the Hort Council, Oak, uh, et cetera, is really, really inspiring. And I, I think it's a testament to how this local food stuff can lean into the support network that we have here in the state to better amplify beyond just again, going door to door or honing your individual uh, email marketing skills, we, we talk about those things and those are really, really important. But it, this is this has been something that has changed and I would I hope to see that our producers as we move forward uh, realize that this is not something that just happens and, and I, I know many of many many do, uh, but it's just really, really special to be able to see the growth of this movement across time and, and all of this integration and cooperation and amplification in the academic spheres and the, the marketing spheres is a really, it's a new thing. It's a, a trend, a hot new trend or whatever that our title was originally. Um, and so I'm, I'm just really hopeful that we can think of more clever ways uh, to do that and lean on these, these institutions and, and pull them in the direction that we want to see them go. So awesome.
I think we had a couple questions or comments or something sprung up. Yeah, the first one I see is, um, is it still a CSA if you don't collect upfront payments? Or what would you call it if the customer commits to buy in advance but pays upon receipt? Um, yes, I would still call that a CSA. I know a lot of CSAs are actually doing that now, uh, again, to make it more accessible to more people where you have this upfront agreement, um, but then people pay either like a weekly or a biweekly basis instead of paying all upfront. Um, let's see. Um, people just expressing challenges of kind of integrating CSA software platforms and payment systems um delivery options yeah understandable um okay brett this one is for you um so health insurance and health providers offering vouchers slash prescriptions for people to join csa would this be what you call institutional csa I don't know that I'd necessarily call it institutional CSA. So all of the all of the voucher program CSAs that we that we are able to access and that the Farm Share Kentucky Farm Share Coalition offers, they are normal CSAs where you can just anybody off the street can go and be a member. It's just that we get a little discount coupon thing that we can use as because our employer pays for it or, you know, offers it to us as a benefit. And so I wouldn't necessarily call that an institutional CSA per se. I would say I would call that a CSA voucher program. And the other thing that you're talking about there, which is this idea of being able to, for a, um, a doctor or some other healthcare provider, being able to write a prescription for vegetables or for a particular food product and then for insurance companies to be willing to cover part or all of the cost of that is something kind of altogether different. I mean, it, it functions in the same way, but um, that's been, you know, it's a really interesting part of a conversation that sometimes is called food as medicine or food is medicine. Uh, the, the extent to which those programs will be able to uh, to um, interact with the local food system in the long term is going to be an interesting one. You know, so is it, I write a prescription for vegetables and well, where can I cash it? Mainly just, you know, grocery stores or something like that. Uh, Sharon has talked about these really innovative pilot projects uh, or not pilot, but uh, pioneer projects that have, you uh, taking place in, in Letcher County and in Bowling Green, these pharmacy and fresh RX programs. And those are again, examples where you have these really, really smart, forward thinking, dedicated people who have pushed institutions to do something different. Um, but that's a, maybe a long winded way around of, of just saying, yeah, there are different types of programs. I wouldn't necessarily call them institutional CSAs necessarily. It's, it's more like here is a here's a rebate or here's a here's some money off of a traditional CSA and it's a, they kind of interact or they they act separately. Anyone else have any other questions? Um, Charlene, I just want to give you a shout out for your incredible questions all night. Uh, super super appreciative and just I think yeah just got got me thinking about a lot of stuff and I think caused a lot of good conversation other people thinking about stuff too um okay we have a question is there someone local i can talk to about packaged beef csas this is such a good question um uh, I mean, I'm, yeah go ahead. yeah i I, I would say if you if you want to send us an email um because it depends on what the nature of your question is uh, but we do have enough people. I, uh, Katie Bowman was on the chat uh, or on the call. She works with has worked has worked in the past and is working with K Card. Uh, but yeah, you can email us and we will figure out if your questions are if it's marketing related. We have some things that we can help with. And if, if it's more like what do I need to do processing and labeling, then that's a a different thing altogether. 
Yeah, but we we know people that we can refer you to for sure for those kinds of questions. Yeah, and if they don't respond to me, I'll have Emily will get, get in contact with them. The enforcer, that's what they call me. 